It is episode number 67 of the River City Hardball Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Gibson, and it's a pleasure to welcome in Brett Myers uh, from Inglewood High School and also the Philadelphia Phillies. Made a few stops in the major leagues over a decade-plus career in Major League Baseball. Uh, Brett out of the Jacksonville area. Uh, Brett Myers, man, uh, great to have you with us. How are you? Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Absolutely. And uh, Brett, I want to first start with uh, your career at Inglewood. Uh, tell me about uh, what that was like back in high school. You won a state championship back at, at Inglewood. Tell me about that. Well, uh, I started at Bowles uh, and I ended up at Inglewood my sophomore year under uh, Mike Boswell. And, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I, we had a lot of talent um, with our team uh, through, you know, my junior year and, and uh, we came up short my junior year. Uh, against Bishop Moore and then our senior year was just we just uh, I guess you would say we were kind of hellions like in hell bent on uh, just going out and just beating up on everybody <laughs> and uh, as, as I recall like we were a bunch of uh, I, I don't know the right word to put it but we were just mean on and off the field I guess you would say just uh, wouldn't take nothing from anybody so it, it was uh, it was the I guess the glory days and we've grown up since then but it was definitely a fun time and we we uh I still talk to some of the guys and and I think Kevin Johnson the other day sent me a picture of us and um when we went to California our senior year for spring break to play a tournament out there and, and it's just kind of cool reminiscing after 20 some odd years uh, uh still catching up with those guys and we're still friends today. I think I saw a picture a few weeks ago of you and Coach Geiger and Coach Boswell. What was that like to get together with those guys again? Uh, well, I mean, I think somebody's always said to me, or I, I, at least I've always felt this way, uh, the, you know, the definition of a, of a good coach is the ones that you're still in contact with. And, and uh, you know, uh, Boswell, Geiger, and Billy Bell meant a lot to me for, you know, my high school career and everything. And even – even when I did uh, make it in the minors and in big leagues, they would come and watch me and I'd always leave them tickets and stuff like that. So we've stayed in contact for this long and, and uh, actually uh, Mike and Mike's going to be coaching. Boswell is going to be coaching my son this summer. So it, it, um, it's kind of like a, you know, and it's good to have him still in my life to, to teach my kid and, and what he taught me. And, and cause you know, you know, teenagers, they don't listen to their parents. So <laughs> Is that with the Dodger Scouts or Florida Prime? Who's that with? Yep, uh, Dodger Scout team, which is, I guess, all part of Florida Prime. So, yeah, so it'd be with the Dodger Scout team. I guess that's what they call them. So. Yeah, I'll actually be involved with that this summer, so really looking forward to that. Uh, yep. Take me back to that year you guys won the state championship. What was that year like? And tell me about that run. Well, uh, at the time, uh, from what I remember and everything, there was a lot of talented baseball players in Jacksonville at the time with Tony Richie's and, and our main rival that year was Bishop Kenny and we could not stand them. And I knew they couldn't stand us either. So, um, we ended up squaring off in districts and they beat us. And then, uh, we ended up both ending up in the final four, which I thought I still think is kind of crazy uh to this day to have two teams from the same city in the in the state championship in the final four um in the same class so um and they ended up losing to miami my senior pace and we had to play daytona seabreeze with uh jr house and bo hall and you know they had some talented guys and we ended up facing monsignor pace in the state championship and and um it was kind of a crazy time because i had pitched the the day before and not the championship game because Boz's philosophy was you got to get there first. And, and we threw Charlie Farah, who I think never lost a high school game, if I'm, if I'm sure about that. But um, uh, so he goes out and gives up two runs the first inning. And I'm like, oh, boy, like, this is <laughs> not going to – because they were a really good team. But they threw their ace the day before to beat Bishop Kinney. But they still had a kid on the mound throwing 88 to 90 and – and uh, we went three up, three down the first inning. And then Charlie went out and gave up two runs. I'm like, uh-oh, it's going to be a long one. So, uh, and then we ended up, I came up, I guess, three, two count in the bottom of the second and hit a solo home run. And I think that kind of got his kick started. And then we just poured it on him after that. I think we ended up beating him eight to two or eight to three, something like that. And, and uh, I mean, but we were a good scrappy team. Um, and it just, Boz used to, uh, put four of us, four of the, you know, his top hitters in the last group 
So when the other team would show up to the field, they'd see us hitting all these home runs. So try to play some intimidation, I guess, for them. But it was <laughs> yeah. a it was a good strategy because some of them got really intimidated. And I mean, we weren't really small guys either. I mean, with me, uh, Kevin Johnson, Derek Nunley, uh, Brent Seriano, Ross Clifford. I mean, we were all six foot plus, and and uh, these guys coming in and watching us hit balls like that probably wasn't probably wasn't the best feeling in the world. Speaking of uh, feelings, do you remember how you felt when you won the state championship? Just like, I, well, not not really, but yes. I mean, we were elated, no doubt. But I, um, I think it was just kind of a, a sigh of relief because we all knew that it's what we wanted to do and what we felt like we were destined to do. Um, I didn't even buy a class ring that year because I just felt that we were going to win a state title, and and we ended up winning the title. So. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, it was kind of like uh, we knew we were going to do it, or at least in my opinion, I felt like that we were going to win it. Nobody was going to get in our way, and I think the rest of the team felt that way too. I mean, like I said, we were just a hard, scrappy team, and and we had a lot of help too. If, um, um, Don Siriano actually came in, a former bowls coach, would come in and throw us BP and talk to us and and because uh, how many times has he been there? You know, I think that <laughs> our first – our first uh, run at Inglewood was Mike was Boswell's um, first state title. So, so uh, you know, with ha having Siriano there with a little bit of experience of being, being in there before kind of gave us a sense of uh, ease, I guess, and preparation. And I think we were we were just very prepared to go out there and handle the job. And then following your high school career, you're drafted uh, by the Phillies in the first round. You know, take me back to being drafted in the first round. I mean, that's something that very few people in their life have have an opportunity to get to do. Right, and um, you know, I I had uh, since I was a little kid, uh, probably since I was seven years old, I told my dad. Well, one time I was watching maybe a Cubs or Braves game, and because that was the only thing on TV then, WGN and TBS. So, right, uh, and he he said. I said to him, I said, that's what I want to do when I grow up. When I was like seven, he said, well, one in a million make it. And I guess I apparently I turned around and told him, I said, why can't I be that one? And I think that kind of started my journey. And uh, knowing how hard it was just to make it, I had to work really hard to get there. And I pretty much dedicated my whole life to being a major league baseball player since I was seven years old. It's like the only thing I, I cared about was playing baseball. So um, I, I just, the hard work and everything, I'm glad that it paid off to work, to be able to be a first rounder as, uh, I really pushed myself. My dad would train me, uh, pretty hard and, and just, just to try to make me the, in the best shape I could be in and, and, uh, keep me healthy as, as, as well. And, uh, that was, that was, uh, I didn't mind putting in the work because I wanted the end goal to be what it, what it ended up being. And, and some of these kids these days that are that are just absolutely gifted talent, talented players around need to understand that you can be as talented as you want, but you still got to put the work and the hard work in and in order to achieve the goal, if that is your goal, you know, because it's not it's not an easy task, you know, through the minors and and, you know, the stuff leading up to the draft is all fun. You're in high school and that's all good. And then then all of a sudden you're thrown out in the world uh, playing minor league baseball and not really knowing, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, that's such a lesson for, for anybody. You can have all the talent in the world, no matter what your field is, but if you don't put in the work, it's not going to really matter too much in the long run. And, you know, to that point, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, may get drafted uh, in the first round, but not many people can last uh, after that. And not many people can make it in a big league career 10 plus years like you did. I mean, uh, take me through what the, what that was like being a big leaguer for that long. Well, I mean, like I like I said, uh, when I got drafted, I wanted to go play in the big leagues immediately. Like I thought my stuff was good enough. Um, I thought I threw harder than some of the guys. I, I used to make jokes about Greg Maddox and I mean, saying that I throw harder than him. And I literally that's how immature I was at the time and didn't know what it took to be at an elite level like that. And, you know, I get to the minor leagues, my first or second outing, there's a 16, 17 year old kid from Dominican or whatever. And I throw a fastball at like 96, 97, he puts it in the parking lot. And I'm like, Oh boy, I suck. So I'm like, it's going to be a long road. So, 
but it, but it never I never stopped learning or evolving as a player and as a pitcher and that was the hardest thing to to do was um just like make adjustments because you, you're so stuck in your ways I guess you would say uh I would say that this is how I got here so I'm going to stick with that but in trying to stay be the same person that you were that made you the pitcher that you were but at the same time listen and take in advice and try to try to evolve as a pitcher and as a player and uh, as a, as a man, I mean, it, it's very hard to go as an 18 year old kid at, right into the world and start paying your own bills and stuff like that. When all only thing you worried about before was playing baseball and you had everything taken care of and stuff like that. But then you had to, you had to, there was two parts of, you know, playing the game and uh, the minor leagues is where you kind of learn all that stuff and, and get used to the travel. So that when you get to the big leagues, it's a lot easier and you know what to prepare for. Um, but I would say the minor leagues is like the hardest grind that, that anybody would have to go through um, just with the bus rides. And, and I mean, I think they take care of the kids a little bit better now, but, you know, PB and J's all the time. And, you know, just like the, it's just kind of like in the movie, you know, in the movies like uh, Bull Durham, you know, you ride the buses, you play, you try to pass the time as much as you can. But and then when you get to the big leagues, it's like they cater to you. So it's a little bit different, but you kind of, you have to keep that same work ethic and not be satisfied. You know, like you could go out there and have like a really good start and be like, yeah, I'm on top of the world. And the next start you get your, you know, stuff pushed in and you're like down in the dump. So the best thing that I learned was be on that same level plane and never, never ride the roller coaster. And that's really hard to teach young kids these days or talk to them about that. Uh, cause they want to ride that roller coaster. Like, Oh, I was like two for three tonight. All right. With, and then the next night I'm oh for three with three punch outs. And then, then you go, and then you're trying to, you're trying to dig a kid out of a hole. I'm like, you're not in a hole. You just had a bad night. And guess what? You get to play again in the day or so, or the next day, you know, and the, the hardest thing with, with failing as a starting pitcher in the big leagues and in the minors and, and stuff like that is that you have to wait four days and you have to think about that for four days of how to get better. And it's almost, more draining than the actual pitching itself instead of just going, you know what, I'm going to wash myself of that one. I'm not even going to worry about it. I'm going to go out there and keep competing the next time. And hopefully the results will be there. Um, there's only one thing you can do is work hard and, and uh, fix the stuff that's and repeat your mechanics, fix the stuff that's wrong. And that's probably like the, the hardest grind is just the mental state of playing in the big leagues and, and knowing that the other guys on the other side, are just as good or better than you are and you have to you have to try to outthink them the the thought process and everything it's like playing chess out there it's it's just a it's just a whole mind mind game pretty much and and uh but you have to tell yourself to you know you still have to do what's best for you like what's your, what your best stuff is that day and that's how, that's how you got to learn how to pitch with that instead of just trying to throw it by guys i mean it's a it's a whole thought process that you got to try to teach yourself or, or, or rely on people to help you uh, get through the good times and the bad times, I guess you would say. A few more minutes here with Brett Myers out of Inglewood High School in Jacksonville and a big league career uh, spanning over a decade in Major League Baseball. Give me a story from Major League Baseball over that period of time. You got to have something that, that sticks in your mind. Um, like as in pranks or is it <laughs> as in whatever uh, you got, man, whatever you got. Um, well, okay, I'll give you the best story, I guess, for me. Um, um, there, there was a pretty good prank we pulled, but uh, it was the same year in 08. But uh, you find that on YouTube. It's pretty funny. Um, but um, uh, in 08, I actually uh, came back from the bullpen. I was, a, I was a closer in 07, and they needed me to come back to be a starter in 08 because we got Brad Lidge. And I was totally opposed to being – uh, back to go starter because I love closing so much but I understood what the team needed and I didn't put a fuss about it um, because I was, I'm a team player uh, and I went spring training prepared to be a starter and everything well the first half of the year it was not going good I mean I was get beat around out um, it was kind of the transition back I was I guess I was too stubborn to see it at the time the transition back to being a starter was I needed to pitch and not just throw out of the bullpen. I would just come out and let it all eat for an inning and, you know, try to strike everybody out. 
and then as a starter, you're supposed to, you know, be more efficient and, and throw, um, let guys put it in play and not try to strike everybody out. Well, I was out there trying to strike everybody out. I'd have a hundred and something pitches after four or five innings and it just wasn't working. And then I'd fall behind, make mistakes. Guys would hit homers. And I, I was just, I had like a five, eight, two ERA, like a month before the all-star break. And I was just in the pits, man. It was terrible. Um, it was a bad time. And I told him, I said, put me in the bullpen. I'm not helping the team. Like, let me get it. Let me see if I can find it and get it back. And they didn't do that. They sent me to the minor leagues, which I was, I did not have to go. And I was fighting it for a minute. Um, and then I just kind of gave in to myself because my pride was got, my pride got in the way and I didn't want to go to the minors, but they sent me down for about 20 days, four, four or five starts just to, figure out what I was doing wrong and to basically give my brain a break. It's kind of what it came down to. And then uh, I came back up after the all-star break and I ended this, I ended the, the second half with like a one five or one six ERA. And, and then we made it to the playoffs and then we won the world series. So it was kind of like what an up and down year I had, you know, I was in the dumps. I, I got, I got sent down to the minors to a world series champion all in one year. And this is kind of, it changed my whole perspective of the game of baseball about riding that roller coaster. Like I said, um, it's so hard to stay on that even plane through the good and the bad and, and try to be the same guy in the clubhouse every day. You know, even though you're like miserable because you can't, you ain't doing your job well enough to my standards, at least, you know, let alone the fans and the, and the organization. So for me, that's probably one of the best stories I could tell somebody uh, about just like the hardships of playing the game of baseball and probably my best story I got for being in the big leagues. Cause um, I didn't, I did not expect that. And I, I probably didn't even really pay attention to it until we won the world series. Like a, a year later was like, man, I got sent to the minors that year, <laughs> you know? And so, it, and I was there for a month. I was in the minor leagues for a month and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was a tough time at the time and, but it all worked out in the end and, and, uh, that's all I can ask for. Tell me about 2008. You guys win the world series. You were a big part of that world series team with, uh, Ryan Howard and Chase Utley and Jimmy Rollins. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Brad Lidge earlier. Tell me about yeah. that group and tell me about the year you guys won. Well, I, I think it all started back in 07. So uh, we all came up together for the most part. Um, you know, th they might have had a couple – Jimmy might have had a couple years on me before I got there in the big leagues. But for the most part, we all kind of came up – we all knew each other in the minor leagues. And, and so it, it was – we were kind of already, you know, teammates at the time, I guess you would say. But – I think 07 really kind of kicked us in the teeth a little bit. We did, we had no idea other than playing in the minor leagues what playoff baseball was like was like and we knew exactly what the city of Philadelphia wanted and they wanted to be in the playoffs and win a championship, you know, very demanding fans which we were demanding of ourselves too. We just didn't, you know, have the pieces the years before we had always come up short with the wild card thing and then 07 I think we were I think we were like seven games back with eight or nine to go and the Mets were up and they just collapsed. And we ended up uh, the last, uh, the last day, last game of the year, I was closing and uh, the, the, I took the mound against the nationals. I, it wasn't a safe situation, but um, I took the mound and the crowd went absolutely crazy because the, the Marlins had beat the Mets. And that means all we had to do was win and we were already winning. I think we were up four at the time. So I went out there and got the job done and we ended up going to the playoffs and then we got swept by the Rockies, which was just like heartbreaking and mind blowing. I, I think I threw like one inning the whole time against the Rockies, but they had a good young pitching staff and we were playing in the shadows, not to make excuses, but it was pretty tough hitting off those guys. And, and um, so with, with that, with that being said, the next year in spring training, we all came in with an attitude of that, Jimmy Rollins came out and said it, that we are the, we're the team to beat. And uh, we all felt the same way. I'm like, okay, there's a little bit with like the baseball guys. I'm like, don't say that because then they might, you know, kick us in the teeth or whatever again. But, but um, 
he was absolutely right. And I think we all felt that in our heart. We just didn't have the, the marbles, I guess, to say it out loud like he did. And that was, that's something, the whole demeanor of the clubhouse and everything. It was like, a, we know what we need to do all the spring training. We knew exactly what we needed to do to become the team that we ended up being. And I mean, we got hot and we had a lot of good pieces, Jason Worth, you know, we, um, you know, Pat Burrell, it was, there was a lot of talented ball players and a lot of uh, guys that, that Ed Wade drafted um, that put us in that situation. And, and we just, I mean, the maturity level changed after 07, I think, because we actually knew what it took to become or and to get through a playoff stint and what the electricity was going to be like in the crowd. And, and the adrenaline that happens when you're in the playoffs is something that you've never felt before like as a pitcher I mean yeah you can go play in in a big stadium with a bunch of people there and but it, the implications of those games were so high that that my put it this way my body was sore for the next three days after I pitched in the playoffs compared to like uh during the season it'd probably be like a day day and a half two days maybe I'd be sore but it for the next three four days it was I was sore and I didn't know why I'm like I've been doing this all year what's the problem well my velocity ticked up like three, four miles an hour. It was just, it was just the adrenaline just took over. And I didn't, you know, I don't think I broke, you know, 93 all year in, in 08. And then all of a sudden in the playoffs, I'm like 95, 96. I'm like, I don't think I've seen that since I was 18 years old or, or 20 years old, at least, you know, and here I am 28, you know, out there throwing, you know, firm. And, and it was, uh, it just, that adrenaline rush is crazy. It's just amazing. So and, and I wouldn't I wouldn't replace it for the world. I can tell you that. And it's kind of like the, the reason why you play the game. You're sitting in your backyard thinking it's three, two count bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth in the World Series. You know, it's, it's crazy stuff like that, that you that you end up in that situation from a from a you know, small school like Inglewood High School. What was Philadelphia like when you guys won the title? Well, they uh, it, it, like I said, oh, seven, they went absolutely crazy. Um, uh, and, uh, I mean, I remember jumping in the stands and just getting mauled. I mean, it, they were, they were so ecstatic and, and then, and then we got beat three and out and I was like, oh crap, you know, it wasn't the best situation, but winning the world series, that, that's another pretty good story right there. Cause I don't think this has ever happened again or ever happened in the first place. Uh, um, and we started game five, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was game five. Hamill started that game. I was supposed to pitch the next game and we were, we were winning and the rain was just pouring down. I don't even know how Hamill's held the ball. The field was just mud. It, the ball, if the ball hit it, it was going to stop. Well, they let the game go on. I couldn't even hardly see Cole out on the mound. Uh, the rain was coming down so hard and it was freezing out and he's out there pitching in this. And I'm going, this is ridiculous. When are they going to call it? You know, well, they waited for Tampa Bay to tie it up. And then it continued, and then they called it. And we tried to wait it out, and it didn't let up. It didn't let up for the next four days. So they would call us and say, don't worry about coming in today because it was raining. There's nothing we could do, you know, unless we needed to throw. We'd go in and throw. I'd go in and probably I'd throw a bullpen just because I was slated to pitch the very next day after that game, regardless of how it happened. But um, So I'd go in and get my work in. But, but uh, And then we ended up winning it. Four days later, starting in like the top of the seventh or bottom of the seventh or something like that, or bottom of the sixth uh, with the leadoff double. It's like starting a new game in the sixth or seventh inning. With And I'm going, this is insane, man. And, it, and you know, because you know you got to – sometimes it takes big league teams and guys to get started, you know. Um, sure. A couple innings, you know, to get used to the pitching or get, you know, or whatever, get used to it, you know, uh, in the game to – you know, let it progress. You know, you see the first couple innings, it's not a lot of high powered offense until the second or third time through the through the lineup. But well, we had to get it done immediately. And it was one of the craziest things I think I've ever been been through. And we ended up getting it done, which uh was was crazy. I d I don't think I've ever had a beer after a game at eight o'clock. So that was like it was like strange, you know. It was strange that the game was over in an hour and we were World Series champions after waiting four days to, you know, I guess the inevitable was going to happen at some point. So, 
a few more minutes here with you, Brett. Really appreciate the time. This is awesome stuff. Um, who is your toughest out? Who was the guy in your major league career that you just couldn't get out? Well, I like uh, people ask me that a lot, and they expect me to say Barry Bonds and all that other stuff, Pujols, all those the, those are the big, big, big hitters. And uh, honestly, Barry was a tough out, but I, I got him out. Um, but he got me too. I mean, he's a, he was an animal. But but um, the guys that gave me the most trouble were the guys that the little guys like David Eckstein, uh, Juan Pierre, uh, just like, like guys, I, I mean, it didn't matter how nasty of stuff I threw up there. They would just continue to foul it off. And by the time their bat was over there, nine, 10 pitches in, I'm going, geez, man, I'm here. Just hit it out or something, you know? I, like, <laughs> and so I, uh, David Eckstein, Juan Pierre, were, they were terrible nemesis of mine. I, I just, and there's other guys too that I'm failing to mention, but it was just the little scrappy ball players that really gave me trouble. Um, and I, I just, by the time I got done with X time, I had, you know, pool holes and holiday and all those guys that try to get out. And I'm, and I'm like, that guy just wore me down. Next time I base it, I'm just going to throw it right down the middle and see how far the little guy can hit it because <laughs> I'm dead tired after it. And Juan Pierre, I don't think I ever struck him out. I couldn't get, I couldn't strike him out. He was just a scrappy and then I ended up walking him and then he's on third and I'm going, well, it's going to be one nothing. Because he he was one of those type of guys, man, that, that drove me crazy, and um, and that's that's like respect due to him to him, like for being that type of ball player. It wasn't nothing, you know. I don't have any um, animosity towards him because I I just think it's kind of crazy that I had trouble with those guys, but the bigger power guys I didn't didn't really struggle that much against or or fear them as much. I I'm not even sure I feared Eckstein or Pierre. I, it just it was just like oh crap. Like here, here they come. This is going to be a long at bat because they always, they always work me deep in the count, and it just, uh, it wear you down. You mentioned Barry Bonds, uh, and we can get into a whole can of worms with him. You, you think he should be in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, that was an error. Well, they talk about the steroids and stuff like that. I think every most everybody was using them at the time, um, and I can, I can tell you this that. I don't care how much steroids you do, you still got to be able to hit the ball. Um, whether how much stronger he was or how he recovered faster and everything is a different story. Um, I, I still believe that, that you have to, you still have to hit the baseball. And I can tell you this steroids does not make you hit the baseball. You know, that's hard work in the cage and, and uh, just having a good swing and stuff like stuff like that. But uh, I'm not saying that it didn't make him stronger and stuff like that, but, I mean, like I said, in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, most everybody was on that stuff anyway, um, just for recovery and strength, I guess. I don't know. Um, I never touched it. So um, I would hate to have seen me on that stuff, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Was there, um... It was already intense. I was already intense. So I didn't need to be any more intense than, than, uh, than that. Was there ever any temptation in the clubhouse where, where guys – I'm not asking you to name names of guys who took it, but was there any temptation at any point for you? Um, no, because I, I kind of – because like I said, I got to the to the big leagues, uh, you know, in 2002, so it was kind of like on its way out. So they were testing at that time. Um, I think I, – I don't, I don't know exactly when they started testing, but it was like creeping up on everybody in, in, the, in the early 2000s where – they started started testing guys for it and stuff like that or talking about it. And so, no, I didn't, I mean, they, they have us right. They had them, they have it so bad right now. Not, not bad, but um, there's like a list of stuff. You can't get at GNC because you can test positive for the stuff like, like protein stuff. And I don't know what these companies put in the stuff, but you have to like send it off to get it tested before you can take it. So it's almost like major league ball players now can't even take any supplements to uh, help them in fear of a lot of these guys getting 50 game suspensions and stuff like that um, aren't taking actual steroids, but they, they make it to where they give you a list of the stuff that you just have to be, you have to do due diligence. You know, you have to, you have to look up the stuff and figure out if it, what it's got in it and, and send it or ask somebody. So it's kind of a pain in the rear end to say, hey, can I take this? And they'll be like, no, well, I just spent $50 on this. Let's see if I can take <laughs> it back, you know? So so they've cut down on all that stuff to where it's almost like you can't even uh, take that, the the supplement from GNC. And 
and that's that's a uh, you know that's I don't think that that's necessarily a problem, but they they really want to get steroids out of baseball, and they're doing their they're doing their darndest to get it out of there. I can tell you that. As a pitcher, when you knew somebody was was on something and they hit a bomb off you or something like that, did, did you did that make you even more frustrated because you knew that he was cheating? Or, or you mentioned earlier, I mean, you still got to hit the baseball, right? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't care. I didn't care what he took. You know, I mean, it's like I said, you still got to hit it. I don't. I don't believe uh, steroids uh, make you, you know, a better baseball player. I just, I just don't believe that. I think it does help for recovery. I think it helps for your strength and stuff like that. But I, I, I if a guy hit a home run off of me, I was already pissed. I didn't care what he was on. I mean, it didn't matter. I, I was mad that he hit it, honestly. Um, and that was, uh, that's just the way I played. You know, I mean, there was pitchers probably on the stuff too. I mean, they talk about Clemens and everything like that, but. But I don't care. I I, I don't. I, you know, did it help his longevity? Probably. But I mean, he was it's not like he was throwing ninety eight when he was forty years old. You know, he he had he was right. still a good good pitcher then. Um, and uh, maybe it helped his longevity. Maybe it didn't. I don't even know. I mean, I don't even know if he took it. I didn't even see him take it. You know what I'm saying? I'm kind of like they just speculating, or they caught him, or blah blah blah. I mean, but like I said, these days. You could probably drink a beer and it and it's got steroids in it. I don't I have no <laughs> idea what, what these companies are putting in these things. So, uh, final moment with you, uh, Brett. Again, I could do this all day long, man. This is awesome mm-hmm. stuff. I'm a baseball yep. diehard, so this is great stuff for me as well. Yep. Uh, last thing, tell me about your son uh, playing for Bartram Trail. I mean, that's got to be pretty cool to watch him out there. Yeah, I uh, you know I hoping that uh, he can you know keep progressing and getting better. But um, I've, I've seen a lot of really good arms over the past uh, nine games they've played. A lot of D1 commits out here in, in Jacksonville, um, around here. And it's it's insane that I didn't even know about some of these kids, like the Dakota Stones. Uh, I knew about the Bowmeisters. Uh, you know, the um, her Clay's got a couple guys over there, up there. And then um, – I haven't seen them play yet, but Fleming Island has three guys that are that I that I I know about. Saw two of them when Bartram played them, and it's just it's just like they there's and they're getting another D1 guy tomorrow apparently from from St. Joe's. So it's fun to watch all these guys compete against some of the best arms in town, uh, from from my knowledge. Um, and it, it just I think it's good for their. Um, their progression because if you don't see that stuff and then all of a sudden it gets on you we'll find out what type of hitter you are what type of player you are so watching some of the d1 guys throw and everything the the juniors the seniors and stuff it gives you some perspective of of uh where your son and where um some of the other players are and it's it's fun it's fun to watch it's fun to watch these kids play and compete and of course i don't really do nothing on i didn't really do anything on the on the weekdays anyway so I think I'm going to go watch some baseball and I think I'm going to go tonight, watch Creekside and Sandalwood. So I'm a baseball nut too. I just, I like watching the Colby Frieda's pitch and stuff like that. So, so uh, it's, if, if anything, I can help some of them like with, with some of my experiences, if they'll listen. Um, that's what I, I think I uh, cherish more than anything is the, my knowledge to try to, you know, help them along the way, because I know that their, their path is, is still, uh, progressing forward and I remember when I was 17 18 year old kid competing and and uh, I didn't take anything from anybody and I want these kids to have that same mentality and know that their last name and, and who they are if you're throwing in the 90s and stuff like that people talking about you you know around town they're talking about these kids Fritos I mean if it gets to me the Dakota Stone kids the you know the Mastatunos the Carwiles the all these uh, kids with with big arms and, and good stuff it's it's uh that's that's more fun to watch than watch watch them abuse my son at the plate because I think that's pretty funny when because he's a mental midget when it comes to I'm like these guys are like seniors and you're up there as a freshman trying to compete I said just keep go play man if you suck you suck it's fine <laughs> <laughs> right yeah it's uh there is a ton of talent in Jacksonville in baseball you know I cover them on this podcast you know St. John's Country Day's got seven of their yep. starting nine Brad, Hodges, to Brad Hodges yep yeah, Brad yep, Hodges yeah. going to Virginia. It's amazing to yep. see. Yeah, and and he was and he was probably uh, he was he was on the night that he that he faced Bartram and and I, that was fun to watch. And I've I've known 
I've known Brad since he was like 11 years old, um, 11 or 12 years old. We played at the same organization uh, for travel ball. And uh, who, who would have thought, you know, you never knew. I never saw the kid really play that much. And uh, now he's out there, you know, as a junior. And, and I, I don't know what his uh, velo was. And I kind of really don't care what these kids' velos are. I just watch how they pitch. Uh, Brad Hodges was in and out, uh, strikes away, pounded, pounded in well, good breaking ball, good change up. And uh, that's any, he, any he pitched any, any, uh, that's how you beat teams. You, you beat them by locating fastballs and, and uh, getting a breaking ball over. And that's, that's stuff. That, that's fun stuff to watch. And I'm like, those are tough at bats that, that I like watching the kids grind out. Brett Myers, uh, over a decade long in Major League Baseball, uh, first round draft pick out of Inglewood High School, a state champion there and a World Series champion in 2008 with the Phillies. Man, this was awesome stuff. We got to do this again soon and uh, look forward to it again. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time, man. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me.